Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon and thank you for coming. I think uh, it's a real tribute in this wonderful uh, sunny day. It's a real tribute to the genius and the appeal of Caravaggio, but also to the um, uh, importance of our distinguished speaker today, Michael Fried, uh, J.R. Herbert Boone Professor of Humanities and the History of Art at the Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore. Uh, Michael Fried uh, is uh, best known as art critic and art historian, uh, who is also uh, a literary critic and also a poet. Uh, as an art critic, he is closely associated first with high modernism, as practiced by artists such as Morris Lewis, Kenneth Lowland, Jules Solitsky, Frank Stella, and Anthony Caro, a good friend of him, uh, and more recently with photographers such as Jeff Wall, Thomas Truth, Thomas Demann, the sculptor Charles Ray, uh, whom we know well here at the Getty, since one of his uh, major sculptures is uh, exhibited here on the stairs uh, uh, leading up to the museum. He's close to video artists like Henri Zala and Douglas Gordon and the painter Joseph Marioni. So this is one side of uh, Michael's interest and uh, personality as an art historian, his interest for uh, contemporary developments of art. But as an art historian, he's best known for his masterful trilogy of books on French painting and art criticism from the middle of the 18th century through the advent of Manet and his generation in the early 1860s. Three very important books that signed the, also the the, uh, our uh, training as art historians, or at least my training as art historian, Absorption and Theatricality, Painting and Beholder in the Age of Diderot from 1980, Courbet's Realism, 1990, and Manet, Manet's Modernism, or The Face of Painting in the 1860s from 1996. In 2010, Michael published The Moment of Caravaggio, based on the Andrew W. Mellon lectures in the fine arts delivered at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, a transformative account of the artist's revolutionary achievement, displaying a unique combination of uh, interpretive brilliance, historical seriousness, and theoretical sophistication, providing sustained and unexpected reasons of a wide range of major works by the great Italian painter. In 2016, this book was followed by After Caravaggio, where Fried examines the nature of the engagement with Caravaggio of the following generation of artists, which includes major painters like uh, Giuseppe Ribera, Bartolomeo Manfredi, Valentin de Boulogne, Nicolas Tournier, Cecco del Caravaggio, and also, a little bit unexpectedly, Guercino. And I would like also to remind you that uh, um, uh, several masterpieces by some of these painters, some of the painters I mentioned, are also present in the, our collection. So you can see in the gallery nearby where the Caravaggio exhibition is displayed in the, in, in the East Pavilion of the museum. Uh, Michael Fried is therefore one of the best equipped historians to introduce us in the groundbreaking art of Caravaggio, and I'm really grateful to him for accepting our invitation to come to Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming Michael Fried. Thank you, David. That was beyond beyond the strict truth, but I uh, appreciate it. So what I'm gonna do today is uh, it's three paths through Caravaggio. Um, the three paths are, each one is determined by one of the three paintings in this remarkable exhibition. Um, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity to see these paintings. Um, so we'll begin with the boy uh, with a basket of fruit, and then there will be a series of paintings following that that I'll talk about. Then I will have the Saint Jerome, and uh, finally we will have the David with the head of Goliath and the paintings that are related to that. This will um, enable us to look at and talk about a significant number of Caravaggio's um, 
masterpieces, uh, but by no means all. I mean, there will be major paintings that won't come up today. Uh, my focus all the way will be on uh, looking at the pictures. Um, so it's going to be, it's not basically a, a talk with a lot of art historical information you can, that, that, that you can find. Caravaggio, Mike, Michelangelo Merisi de Caravaggio, Caravaggio is a place name, was born in 1571 in Caravaggio, not far from Milan, and died in 1610. So he makes it to the age of 39, and given his lifestyle, he did well to make it to 39. <laughs> we can all be impressed. Um, in, he, he represents something like an earthquake in the history of painting. Uh, he's, he's a remarkable figure, um, together with a family of painters from Bologna, the Caracci, um, he, they and Caravaggio together at the end of the 16th century and the very beginning of the 17th century just establish serious European painting on a new footing. Uh, the condition of painting was actually in some ways critical not long before the 1580s and 90s in, um, in Italy and elsewhere and then uh, Caravaggio and the Caracci between them profoundly reoriented and we have partly as a, largely as a result an extraordinary century of painting, 17th century of painting everywhere. Um, Italy, Spain, uh, France. So let's start out with the boy with a basket of fruit from 1593-94. Caravaggio studied in Milan for uh, a number of years with a painter named Simone Petizzano. And then he came to Rome. We don't have a lot of information about his earliest years. In fact, all the information we have about him you know, tends to be somewhat later. But we know that he worked making paintings for another painting, painter named the Cavaliere d'Arpino. And one of his specialties were still life and the like. And this would be an early painting. I mean, this is, so it's 1593, 94. He's, He's 22, 23. Um, and you can see, I think, uh, the marks of a certain kind of youth in this painting. The, on, on one level, the mastery is incomplete. This young boy looking at us, um, lips parted, uh, holding this basket of fruit. On the other hand, the power of the painting is extraordinary, um, and it's extraordinary relative to the painting of its time. The quality that I want to emphasize, right, right from the start, is the quality of presentation. The way the boy and the fruit and the painting are given to us by the painter. An extra, a, a large, portion of Caravaggio's originality and power has to do with his, from the start, discovering and exploiting a new intensity of the relation of the painting to the viewer. It's not that the relationship of a painting to a viewer had never been interested, interesting to painters before Caravaggio, but with Caravaggio, this becomes, I would say, in some ways, the very center of his art. And the force of this painting's address to us, and the sense of this painting's, you might almost say, bestowal of itself to the viewer through the vehicle of this extraordinary basket of fruit, and then the boy himself, I mean, not wholly unlike the basket of fruit, just extraordinarily pretty and with rosy cheeks and deep hair. A boy who probably looked not unlike Caravaggio, my claim here is not that this is a self-portrait, but as you'll see, the self-portrait too plays a very important role in Caravaggio's art. It's not surprising if what his paintings are doing from the start is thematizing, bringing to the fore their relation to the viewer, the first viewer of any painting is the painting's maker. 
And in Caravaggio, as in the work of certain other artists, later this will be true of Gustave Courbet, the French realist, um, that relationship of the painting to its maker in the process of making uh, becomes built into the painting, becomes part of the deepest content of the painting. So already with this, with, with this picture, that dynamic, that dynamic between the painting in its richness given to the viewer, implicating the viewer, is already there. The other thing that I'll just point out, I just am always struck by it, the, this wonderful bowl of fruit, and you'll see still lives, baskets of fruit, uh, I should have said basket, not bowl, uh, come back in his art, but notice to these leaves. And the leaves for me also have a little bit the character of hands. Right? Caravaggio is going to be very aware that we have only one hand in view here, which is his right hand. And notice how it turns into the painting. It turns into the painting the way the painter's own right hand could almost match with it. This is something that's going to occur later very powerfully with Courbet. So I want to emphasize something about, in that sense, the transactional nature of his paintings. They are not simply on the wall, indifferent to us, um, and for us to sort of look at in a detached way. They are engaging with us. They want something from us, um, and the first person they want something from is the painter. Shortly afterwards, uh, there are two pictures like this, uh, called Boy Bitten by a Lizard. One is in, uh, in Florence, in the Longhi collection. Uh, the other, this one, is in the National Gallery in London. Boy Bitten by a Lizard from around 1594. Uh, a very similar boy, uh, also with a flower behind his ear. Uh, this, the lizard is here. It's hard to see because it's dark, and it's biting a finger. And he is reacting in pain and surprise. We get that bare shoulder. Uh, beautiful, beautiful floral still life here with water and reflection. Other still life elements here. And this strange left hand. Uh, like that. My own kind of serious engagement with Caravaggio, I mean, the point at which I realized that I had something to say about him, um, happened standing in front of this picture uh, in the National Gallery in London. Again, partly because I'd been prepared for it by having worked on Courbet and Courbet's self-portraits. And it started to strike me that there was a sense in which this could be seen as a certain sort of self-portrait. I'm going to make, I'm going to flip to another later picture where I see the, the, the same structure so that you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. This is a self-portrait by Matisse from 1918. The structure of this self-portrait is fascinating. In the first place, it's mirror reversed. Um, you see the palette is in his right hand, the brush is in his left. So we know this is the image as he saw it in the mirror. Um, he's looking at himself in the mirror in effect, and you see his canvas just off, off picture to the right, right. It's at right angles to the mirror. So I'm the painter, I'm seated there, I'm looking at the, my image in the mirror, and I'm painting it onto a canvas uh, which is set at right angles to it. Now. You see the same structure in the Caravaggio. If we take that left hand to be something like a displaced or disguised uh, image of his reflection of his own right hand working on a canvas that's there, the left hand would be a left hand holding a palette, and he's pivoting between the two just the way Matisse is. So the deep structure of the painting is of something like a self-portrait. The process of making the self-portrait is going to be something protracted over time in a way that you can see in the Matisse. And here, what we have is this moment of surprise, instantaneousness, shock. This is going to recur again and again in Caravaggio. And the significance of it for me is always that it comes, it's secondary to an earlier stage of kind of protracted effort on the painting when the artist is, so to speak, immersed in the making of the painting. And then at a certain point, the painting has to be set free. The painting has to be released. It has to be severed. It has to be sent out into the world. And in Caravaggio, that's the moment of shock, of severing. It will later in his art turn out literally to be a moment of decapitation, 
of, of an absolute cutting out of the painting, um, in some ways from the artist himself, so that the painting can fully enter the world. Uh, anyway, to me, this, this was a sort of thrilling moment if, uh, of, of seeing a deep structure in a painting that put all the emphasis on instantaneousness, but where the deeper structure was that of a kind of protracted process of making through this structure of what I call right angle mirror reflection. This is a painting called The Musicians from 1594 to 95. It's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It was, at a certain point, really very badly destroyed. A lot of it is repainted. It's repainted extremely well. Um, it's a picture that I grew up in New York. I went to the Met a lot as a kid. I loved this picture. Um, and I kind of fell in love with her, though it later emerged that that was uh, Cupid. Um, and I had to make various emotional adjustments. <laughs> <laughs> By this time, Caravaggio in Rome acquired various very influential patrons. So we have to think of him during these years as literally living in one or another palace, being treated very, very well, having lots of time to make the paintings in as refined a fashion as he wanted to, and being sponsored by these very wealthy, very, very cultured, powerful people, so that he knew the paintings would be bought, they would be acquired. It was, it, he had a really ideal situation. He then sort of relentlessly sent, set out to destroy it and finally uh, did. But nevertheless, it's an important fact about his production during these years. Now, look at the, again, look, look at the structure of this painting. What emerges is, in the first place, a powerful structure of something that we could call a dress. Um, this central figure uh, who is sort of tuning his lute uh, preparatory to making music facing us. And then this element that's going to come back and back and back in Caravaggio, which is a figure seen from the rear. So putting together a figure who faces a dress and a figure who faces away. A figure who faces away, you realize, is facing in the same direction as the painter making the painting, and for that matter, the same direction as the viewer, say us, standing before the painting. So Caravaggio realizes, and this is something, this, this becomes explicit in his painting as in no painting before him, but it's going to become very, very important in the centuries to come. It's there in Courbet in another way, it's there in Manet. It's the awareness that a painting in a certain sense faces in two directions. Most obviously it hangs on the wall and faces the viewer. But if you think of the depicted space, the painting, as it were, faces away into, the, into itself. And that lines up with the orientation of the viewer or the painter making the painting. In other words, it's keyed not just to the presence of the viewer, but to the viewer's own sense of, in this case, his, if we're talking about the painter, but it, if we generalize it, his or her embodiment, their own sense of themselves as an embodied being with a front and a back standing before the painting. These paintings acknowledge human embodiment and work with it, make it part of the medium of painting as no paintings before them. This is important because the standard account of Caravaggio and of Caravaggio's remarkable realism or naturalism is that it was, and we should think of it as, essentially optical, as if it represents simply a new, more acute way of seeing the world. But his paintings aren't just about, his realism isn't just about seeing the world. It's conveying the sense of what it is to be a physical being in a world, in a physical world. And that involves a sense of embodiment, that involves a sense of front and back, that involves a sense of the painting, not simply as something you might call an image, but as a material artifact, which itself faces but gets made in a particular way. All of these considerations 
come into play in Caravaggio with a, I won't say as never before. It's not that there's no hint of this before, but now with tremendous force. Something else to remark is that that's Caravaggio. It's another of his self-portraits. He puts him, and he's self-portrait holding a cornetto. He's going to be playing the cornetto. And you'll notice that he's depicted himself in a way that's kind of consistent with that right angle structure, right? Uh, so you think of that boy, and then you think of how he's presented himself there, again, with his mouth slightly open. Um, does that mean that he made this painting, this image of himself in that painting, using that right angle mirror configuration? I don't know, I even rather doubt it. But that he depicts himself that way shows how acutely aware he is of that structure. This is an artist who knows what he's doing. Whatever else is true of Caravaggio, he's an intellectually extraordinarily acute painter um, about his own enterprise. This is the Bacchus of around 1597 in the Uffizi. And again, it's a time when Caravaggio is still, uh, has these very strong sponsors. And he's produced this remarkably compelling, strange image. A beautiful still life at the bottom. Then this Strange for you, and you see how this goes back to, I mean, we, I could flip back to the boy with the basket of fruit right at the beginning. Um, you, you sort of see the consistency in his art. With this remarkable gesture of the left hand extending this shallow uh, goblet of wine towards the viewer. Of course, that extended left hand is also something like the mirror image of the painter's own right hand extended with the brush towards the painting. So that we have here something that is simultaneously, again, that going back to the boy with the basket of fruit, an image of presentation, as if this gesture offers the wine, but in, by doing so offers the Bacchus himself and by so doing offers the painting to the viewer. The, the sense of, uh, the, of being addressed by this painting is again amazingly powerful. This is all something essentially new. And at the same time, uh, we have that right hand sort of playing with uh, this wonderful um, tie to his uh, ostensible toga. S something that you can't possibly see, but it's true, is in this flask of wine, there is around here a tiny reflection of, and if, we, if you come up close in a strong light, it's a tiny reflection of what seems to be a painter at his easel. I had read about this, um, and I was very interested, I'd already very interested in Caravaggio, and I had very close friends, an art two art historians, a man named Charles Dempsey and a, man named, a woman named Elizabeth Cropper, and they were in Florence, and I was coming to Florence, and I said, could you, and they had lots of connections in the, art, in the world there, I said, could you arrange for us to like, go into the Uffizi some morning before it opens, and they'd have powerful lights, and we could like, see if there really is this little figure there, um, and they did. And so one morning, uh, I and my wife and Charles and Elizabeth all went to the picture with, with and the, the pro, pow, powerful lights, and the guards immediately said to us, ah, oh, you want to see the little guy? Uh, <laughs> they knew all about it. Um, they'd been looking at it for years. And, um, and so, trust me, the little guy is there. Um, so that structure of reflection, and in that sense of, 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 of self-portraiture, even in that sense, is, is built into this picture. We're gonna look at this picture again later um, because it, it, it establishes a certain kind of paradigm for Caravaggio uh, of, of address and presentation. In this case, figured through the presentation of the wine. I'm showing you this uh, just because it's so remarkable. Um, it's strange seeing it so large, because of course it's not large, it's small, it's a small basket of fruit. It's in the Ambrosiana um, Library and Museum in Milan. And it is simply breathtaking. Um, 
in a way, no image. This is not a bad image of it, but no image can convey the precise quality that it has. One really doesn't know. You, when you're standing in front of it looking at it, it kind of defeats your imagination uh, as to how Caravaggio painted it. I mean, it, it doesn't seem quite possible that he just looked at the fruit and painted it that way. Maybe he had some mirror that he looked at it in because there is a way in which it's, it is, in this case, rendered very, very optical as opposed to uh, massively physical. I mean, it, this is a picture that just exceeds my capacity to describe it or evoke it, um, but I, I wanted you to see it. I also want you to notice um, I mean, I'm, I am very struck in some of the still lives. This, was, this goes right to back to the boy with the basket of fruit by these leaves that are like hands. I mean, Caravaggio's paintings are made artifacts. He, as an artist, is acutely conscious of the act, the process, the duration of making. His paintings, in all sorts of ways, acknowledge their madeness, their madeness by the painter there for the viewerness. And here I can't help feeling the sense of well, something like the hands that went into the making of it. I'm struck too by the, that branch that goes off, right? As if it were, I don't know what, even like a paintbrush or something. And then this very famous painting, um, the Supper at Emmaus of 1601 in the uh, National Gallery in London. So it's that moment where, after Christ's crucifixion when he um, meets two of his disciples um, on the road. They have a dinner. Christ is unrecognizable to them. And you see the brilliance of Caravaggio's depiction of Christ. He gives us a Christ who is extremely non-canonical. I mean, this doesn't look like the traditional images of Christ. Um, and they recognize Christ at the moment of his giving the Hebrew blessing over the bread. And that's what happens here, and we, the painting focuses on Christ's act of blessing, but then the responses of the two uh, disciples. Um, one of them, you can see, pushing back violently in his chair in surprise. The other flinging out his hands in that way. And in the foreground of the, well, first of all, you see this, chicken with these sort of, in a sense, pitiful legs, which, but, but I, 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 I mean that, in a, 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 I mean, one has to laugh, but I mean it also seriously in that it, it, it is some kind of prefiguration of, of what is going to come in the narrative. Um, and here we have this another, yet another beautiful basket of fruit um, and coming off the edge of the table. So you have this, this and that. A standard account the standard sort of art historical account of this picture would say something like, by virtue of the fruit, the basket of fruit protruding off the edge of the table, that puts the viewer all the more intensely in the scene. I think that's exactly wrong. I think the structure of those gestures, plus the fruit pushing off the edge of the table, pushes the viewer away. I, it's addressed to the viewer, but it's, it just builds into the painting an element of shock and separation, distance, what I'm going to call severing. Part of what the painting's autonomy as a painting is confirmed by the force of the gestures that actually thrust the viewer back. Of course, there's come some kind of very intense exchange with the viewer. In that sense, it happens at close range. But within that close range, there's something like a split second of distancing. And that's going to be very fundamental to Caravaggio's art. OK, that's our first path. Our second is going to take off from this, to my mind, amazing painting of St. Jerome uh, from around 1605 or 1606. And it brings to light instantly another fundamental resource of painting for Caravaggio. And it's a resource that is, from this moment on, going to become a fundamental resource for European painting, period. And I call that resource absorption, the depiction of absorption the depiction of figures 
totally absorbed or immersed in what they're thinking, doing, or feeling. In this case, it's St. Jerome, completely absorbed in his study of the Bible as he makes his, trans, his early translation of the Bible. I think from Aramaic to Latin. Okay. The force of the painting is inseparable from the force of our conviction in his absorption in what he's doing. There's this brilliant structure of the extended arm holding a pen or you know, a writing implement. Needless to say, it's, this is anachronistic. That's not the way, Jer well, not with Jerome's, there were no books in Jerome's time. There were, there were what, but this is something that happens again and again in the painting of the period. This skull is looking on. He is so absorbed as to be unaware of the skull. And we feel, this is, this, Caravaggio is brilliant in his, uh, I mean, unbelievably brilliant and creative in the actions that he gives to his figures. In this case, by extending that arm, it makes us so aware of the force of the, uh, the suspended action of the arm. The arm was reaching out to do something. It is suspended because at that moment, Jerome is so much in the grip of the thought of what he's doing. What's fascinating about the depiction of absorption is how minimal its indications are. I mean, fundamentally, Jerome is depicted as a brightly illuminated bald head, right? Um, and then we get a little bit of his eyes in shadow and his lower face. The force of our conviction of his inwardness is tremendous. That's what absorption can do. It can give us this conviction of the, the, the inwardness of those figures, the depth of feeling within them. But, but the, very, the way it works is almost paradoxical because we are given just the most minimal expressive indications in the faces of the figures. This we'll see in the next painting we look at, this is carried even further, the next two paintings. Um, so you might ask yourself, where does our conviction of that inwardness come from? Right? What, where, what is the source of it? The, the standard rhetoric, again, is going to be, um, there is no depth of the psyche that Caravaggio cannot find out. I mean, this is said by a very great art historian, um, that he has this capacity to, to render spiritual depth. But the magic of absorption, and I, it, it is a discovery. It's not, there are no, it's not as if there are no absorbed figures in painting before Caravaggio. But just as he radicalizes address, he radicalizes absorption. And he, it becomes, for the first time, an absolute powerful resource for painting, which painters after him are going to seize on and, 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 and pursue for centuries to come. My own impulse is to say that sense of inwardness and feeling has only one place it can come from, namely us, namely from the viewer before the painting. It, somehow the magic of absorption is that it works to lead us to project our own sense of vitality, our own sense of feeling, our own sense of something like empathic identification into the figure so that the depth of feeling, the depth of thought that we discover there is ultimately grounded in something we are led to do by the painting. Uh, I take this, this particular painting to be a really stunning um, example of the power of absorption in Caravaggio's art. And then today looking at it, I saw something that I should have seen long ago, um, but I had never seen before. And that Caravaggio is one of the great masters of the painting of drapery in all of European art. Drapery is an extremely important part of representational painting during all these centuries. Because there's the body and then the drapery, and the drapery extends the realm of the body in all sorts of, in a sense, you could say expressively very free ways. Here, Caravaggio has done something utterly stunning. This man is totally absorbed in what he's doing. You might say he's gripped, he's excited by it. And look at his red drapery as it kind of wraps around him, um, almost as if it is responding to, it is expressing the kind of intensity of the feeling that he's expressing in this very 
uh, minimal way. Then that arm extends, making us again all the more aware of the suspension of action in absorption. The skull is looking on, and here is a drapery that belongs to this end of things. Death, mere materiality, and it just falls. So part of the drama of this painting, it's not just the drama of the skull versus the living man, it's the drama of the excited, corporeal, moving, movemented drapery, red drapery versus the fall of the white. I mean, this Caravaggio is that kind of, it's no accident that Caravaggio is a contemporary of Shakespeare. I mean, what we have in him is a certain, very often a certain kind of poetic power within the image of just the highest level. It's one of the handful of the greatest painters uh, that we have in that sense. The first painting where he really discovers absorption, the penitent Magdalene comes up. It's from 1595-96, and it's in the, Dor the Doria of Pamphili Gallery in Rome. It's the Magdalene as she'd never been represented before. Um, and even at the time, it's criticized as being just a girl of the streets who he just brought into the studio and had her just sit there. I mean, it took some doing for people to, to find, we, pe viewers now find in this something very powerfully moving and affecting in the vein of the Saint Jerome. Um, there she is absorbed in her grief and remorse over her past. Um, and in this completely quiet, absorptive mode. Uh, But there were people who, who couldn't see that. I mean, the, the expressive minimalism of it, um, it took a while for, for it to take, for it to work. It then becomes something that, that the painters who come after him are very excited by and seize on. And here's the fullest version of this in his art, and that's the death of the Virgin, and this is 65, 16, 6, and this is in the Louvre. Um, and here we have um, the Virgin stretched out having died. That, she's this, is, this is controversial in its own right when it's submitted to the church for which he painted it. Uh, it gets rejected, uh, probably because they're unhappy with the portrayal of the Virgin. But here, what I want you to focus on is the figure of Mary Magdalene. Now we don't see her face at all. We just see her bowed head and shadowy head uh, in grief. And we have these uh, disciples all themselves also, their faces almost completely hidden in shadow. Uh, but people find this a deeply, deeply moving painting. Right? It's of this painting that the great art historian said, there is no depth of the psyche, the human psyche, that Caravaggio cannot find out. I'm not saying for a minute that's wrong, um, but it is, so to speak, to concentrate on the effect of the painting, the total overall effect of the painting, and not quite realizing the means by which that effect is achieved. And the means by which that effect is achieved, remarkably, are so expressively minimal. We are barely given the faces at all. The handling of lighting, light and dark, chiaroscuro, plays a very important part in sustaining, bringing about that effect as well. This is the incredulity of Thomas, doubting Thomas. 1600, 161, it's in the gallery at Sans Souci in Potsdam, Germany. And here you see something else. You see it's a brilliant composition. Caravaggio is a fantastic inventor of compositions. Um, th but this is a very unorthodox composition. And one, one, something you might say is that in this picture you see that Caravaggio, absorption does the work of composition. I mean, the, the whole composition of the painting is simply based on the total intense absorption of all of those three disciples, as Thomas puts his finger in the wound, Christ looks down, di brilliantly directs Thomas's hand into the wound, and then look at the subtle difference. They're all absorbed, but look at the subtle difference in expression between these two and Thomas. Can you see the difference? I mean, I think if I were to put this to you as a question, you'd get the answer. He seems slightly surprised, uh, more than they seem surprised. And it's almost as if there's the sight of the wound, but touching is believing, so the finger is thrust into the wound. And then it's as if seeing is necessary to believe the touching. 
It's like, is my finger really in that wound? So that in the end, it is a seeing of a touching that itself is motivated by something that has to go beyond just seeing. This is characteristic of Caravaggio's, again, I want to say something like poetic genius, imaginative genius, to reconceive traditional subjects in such an obvious but uh, radically original way. Something else, again, we talked about the drapery. I want you to see what happens here. See, drapery in Caravaggio will often share the mood of the picture. So we have this kind of extraordinary, almost like excitement in the drapery, just not here, not here, but just in the, in the area of that extraordinary action. And then one more tremendous painting on this path, the crowning with thorns, Christ being crowned with thorns in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. This for me, this is one of my favorite two, three, four, whatever, uh, paintings by Caravaggio. I think it's a kind of sheer masterpiece. It's actually been doubted by certain scholars, but I can't see why it should be doubted. And when I've talked to the people in conservation in Vienna, they say it's in remarkably wonderful condition. So we have Christ submitting to these torments before the crucifixion. Um, this is the reed scepter that he has mockingly been given as king of the Jews. Um, the crown of thorns is being shoved onto his head uh, by these two people. The image of Christ is of the most profound passivity. This again is part of the imaginative genius I'm talking about. It's presenting Christ not as pathetic, not as someone who's just been tortured and tormented. But what he's focusing on here is the idea of Christ's, at this moment, complete acceptance of what is done to him. And the most remarkably, again, poetic expression in the picture of that profound passivity is the way he holds the reed scepter. The reed scepter has been forced on his hands. He doesn't grip it. He holds it between those fingers as lightly as it can be held, but he does hold it. And this passivity, this completely minimal action is, of course, the most efficacious action that's kind of ever taken in the history of humanity from a Christian point of view. It's going to be Christ's acceptance of his sufferings and death that is going to change the world for the rest of time. Then we have the complete absorption, the astonishing absorption of this figure in armor who seems to be something like the supervising officer, the guy who's in charge of this whole operation. And you, if you ask yourself, and we barely see his face, it's cut off, it's in shadow, but we sense again, in the way we have been, the depth of his absorption in what's taking place. In this case, his absorption seems so great he's taking, that it's, it starts to take on the feeling of a kind of identification with Christ. And then Caravaggio does one of his other strokes of utter representational genius, and that's that hand, and the proximity of that hand to Christ's hand. I mean, that hand doesn't have to be there. That hand could have been there, could have been anywhere. He's, you have to imagine that hand moving without the man even being aware of it in a gesture of identification coming as close as possible to Christ's hand. So what we're seeing is something for which there's no textual authority in the Bible. This is, this is just Caravaggio working off of uh, the image that he's making of this absorbed figure's identification with the passive suffering Christ. It's an incredibly profound picture. It's pictorially utterly beautiful. Um, it's worth going to Vienna to see. Third path, David with the head of Goliath. Um, this astonishing painting that you all have, will have seen upstairs. Um, you know the story. Uh, in this case, uh, you also probably know that that's a self-portrait of Caravaggio. It's a question as to when this painting was made. That the, 
we're not sure of the dates of numbers of his pictures. Um, Davide and the Getty have put it very late around 1609 with Caravaggio dying around 1610. I and certain other art historians think it go for an earlier moment, something like 1606. You shouldn't care at all what I think. I'm just not an authority in, in, in dating in that way. But there are serious people who, who, argue, who, who argue both ways. Um, for our purposes, it's not crucial, whether it's 1606 or 1609. Again, it's staggering. You could say Shakespearean quality, poetic invention. The young David, who's based on a young painter who lives with Caravaggio, named Cecco del Caravaggio, who becomes a remarkably fascinating painting, painter in his own right, um, holding the severed head of Goliath, which is the head of Caravaggio. This beautiful sword coming down, again, this brilliant handling of drapery. Uh, this extraordinarily subtle expression of something like at once, you might say, absorbed beholding of the head, at a kind of sympathy, but also a kind of hesitation, drawing back, at the mixed, the quality of mixed feeling. But look, you saw the picture before. You saw the picture before. It's the same structure as the Bacchus, um, but where the Bacchus gives us the wine by way of giving us the picture, along with the uh, still life, all kind of thematized by the tiny reflection here. Here, instead of the wine, instead of the still life, um, is the painter himself. And what we're getting, the, again, in Caravaggio's art, you'll see other examples, I'm going to show you other examples, decapitation, cutting of a head off, it starts to emerge as a major theme. And I associate that decapitation with something like, this is a moment the larger argument would be to say that this is a moment, Caravaggio is the moment, of the emergence of a, a new kind of painting. A painting which at this moment we can call something like the gallery picture, made for new kinds of galleries in Rome, where the picture has to aim at a new kind of absolute autonomy in itself. It has to be framed and separated from what's around it in, with a new force. In that sense, it has to be cut out from its environment. In that sense severed, but also, and this is, this is less obvious, but I really want to emphasize this, it has to be severed from the artist in order to be released into the world. So it makes sense that in this extraordinarily decisive and emblematic picture, the head is the head of the artist himself, right? So the self-portrait, the recurrence of the self-portrait in Caravaggio is not because he just keeps wanting to see himself in his art. It's all part of a structure of trying to separate from the art. So the self that appears there is a kind of vestige or afterblow from a kind of act of severing. This is stupendous painting, needless to say. Um, to go back to a slightly earlier painting, this is the most vivid portrayal of, or one of the two most vivid portrayals of the act of decapitation in his art. This is Judith and Holofernes, an earlier moment, 1599. It's in the Palazzo Barberini in Rome. And here I find myself wanting to see this almost as an allegory for the act of painting itself, as if what's taking, as if she's a stand-in for the painter, as if that cutting of the head off is, is also, at the same time, a depiction of something like the act of painting as it has been emerging in Caravaggio's art. You, there's this great stress on this instant again, like the, the, the pained instant of the boy bitten by a lizard, and that's expressed also in these glass-like jets of paint. So the stress is all on the instant, and then there's this counterstructure of the total absorption immersion of the maid next to Judith. Judith, notice how Judith's face has something of the feel of David's face. Um, committed to what she's doing, but with a certain kind of ambivalence, whereas the maid is completely now wrapped in relation to the picture. So Caravaggio, in, in paintings like this, is actually sort of allowing himself to 
sort of depict or give expression to something like different successive, let me call them moments, within the process of painting. The moment of uh, deep immersion in the painting, of the doing of it, the moment of separation, and if the moment of separation is powerful enough, it might actually lead you to re-immerse. His paintings are full of this kind of complexity of structure, um, in my view. Another related painting, and we're getting towards the end, Truly fascinating, beautiful painting, Salome receiving the head of John the Baptist from around 1607 in the National Gallery in London. Okay. Again, that structure goes right back to the boy with a basket of fruit. It's a structure of presentation. Right? In this case, the presentation is by the executioner who's got his hand on his sword down here and then gives us the head of John the Baptist in this salvo. This is again in that realm of a certain kind of imaginative Shakespeare quality poetry. Her gaze is averted. Her gaze is averted as if to put off the moment of really seeing that head. As if to put off the moment of something like the full separation from the painting. At the same time, her maid, and look at the way in which they virtually share a single body. This is something else that Caravaggio does. So it's as if not just two, two different persons, but something like two different moments in the same protracted act of painting and releasing the painting is completely spellbound by the head. And notice the tremendous affinity between the two, right? It's as if one of them reflects, is identified with the other, with this extraordinary fist, fist of making in the very center of the picture. This is what we're dealing with with this guy. Um, it, they're, they're, structures of this kind of complexity, this kind of pointedness. It, I can well imagine that some of you in the audience, this would certainly be true of lots of art historians, would say everything that he's saying is going too far. Okay, It's going too far. It's pushing it too far. Okay, fine, but then you have to account for it. Right? If, if, if what I'm saying doesn't persuade you, that's fair enough. But we, one can't pretend, that, can't pretend that those structures aren't there. Um, and if the kind of account I'm giving you is unpersuasive, then the onus is on, let's say, certainly the, an art historian who would disagree, to come up with another account. Simply ignoring what's going on won't do it. This is probably the last painting that Caravaggio ever made, and it's one of the most <coughs> profound. It's, it's in slightly ruinous condition. It sits in a bank vault in Naples, if you can believe it. Um, it's the martyrdom of Saint Ursula. Uh, this is the king of the Huns. He wants to marry her. She says no. Uh, he, he executes her. In this painting, he executes her by shooting an arrow into her at this extraordinarily intimate range. Kind of range that I think of as something almost like painting distance. The distance he would be from a painting as if she were the painting, and that is something like the making of the painting. That is Caravaggio himself, again, up against her. You have to imagine her body pressed against his. There's an, a soldier here. There's another soldier there. Um, his hand sort of extends through here as if to stop the thing. So you have to imagine something like Caravaggio himself trying to witness the actual making of the painting, the moment of the making of the painting, um, as the arrow goes into Ursula, who has this extraordinary response to it, looks down as if with a kind of grave surprise at her own mood. We have the same kind of structure in the head of the king of the Huns that we have in those other figures like, like Judith and David. I mean, it's not simple pleasure in what he's doing. Um, but, we ha but it's like Caravaggio straining to see the inception of the act of painting as it is carries out in, in this kind of mortal operation. And there on the breastwork of uh, the King of the Huns, we have a lion who's kind of a symbol, a traditional symbol for the sun, which is to say for light, this basic condition of painting and this painting that is otherwise so dark. So that the last painting we have by Caravaggio, this, to me again, this very profound painting, um, is maybe the most profound and sustained of all of his meditations 
on something like the internal tragic fatal structure of the act of painting itself. Okay, thank you for your attention.